Welcome to Read Becca. My Women Write Classic SFF Readathon did not go quite as planned, but I adjusted plans a couple times over the course of the uh, past week, and I did in fact complete a challenge. So my original plans included these three books, which I did not complete. Um, I originally had gone for picking the prompt of the 1970s. Um, however, that was mainly because I was reading The Dispossessed, which I didn't finish quite, and I also had a number of books on my shelf that I was able to pull from the, the 1970s. One of those that I definitely wanted to read, however, was Lead in the Mist. But, major problem with that, this is not from the 1970s. Uh, many of these older copies have a first publishing uh, date in the, in the cover, and this does, however, it's the first publishing date of this publisher and not the original publication date. So, this was originally published in 1926, in fact. Um, so this is a seminal work of a fairy and folklore classic SFF. It is inspirational to lots of modern writers, so uh, I know Neil Gaiman cites this quite frequently. Um, I think as well it's very similar to what we find in Susanna Clarke's Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norell um, with the hidden fairy world and uh, people who can't quite talk about the influence of the Fae on their lives. So uh, I'm just going to read the summary on the back because it gives a great tone and synopsis for the book. And this uses the term burgers for people who live in a burg, not hamburgers. Uh, <clears throat> the town of Ludd was a prosperous community situated at the confluence of two rivers, one having its source in the land of Ferry. But being a stuffy, rational, and no-nonsense province, ruled by stuffy, rational, and no-nonsense burghers, the people of Ludd refused to believe in fairies, elves, or the like, and they meted out severe punishments to those who did. But when the mayor's son confessed to eating fairy fruit and the proper young ladies of Miss Crabapple's school dashed off into the debatable hills, even the stuffiest burger had to acknowledge that a perfect plague of fairy influence had hit town and now steps would have to be taken. Dun dun dun. So this was great fun. I loved the, the writing. Um, it has such a wit to it and I found it really hilarious. Um, the mayor, uh, Nathaniel Chanticleer is essentially in complete denial and he's, he's kind of living it up. And then his son, Ranulf, uh, starts acting weird and he, they send him to a physician. The physician says, oh no, he's eaten fairy fruit. And they send him away to a farm to uh, kind of get some fresh air. And the farm is, of course, right near fairy. So um, this kind of suspicious physician seems to be an odd fellow in obviously um, seems somehow in cahoots with fairy. But then uh, this Miss Crabapple's finishing school for girls, suddenly all of the girls dash off into the hills under the influence of fairy. So the mayor gets deposed, he loses his job, and they are about to hang him for it, and he rides off to fairy on his own because he's got nothing left to lose. Um, so it, it was hilarious, the premise. Um, once we do actually see some of the, the fairy bits, I, I really could see where that has influenced modern writers. So I just love this book. Um, there is some really great descriptive nature writing and really great descriptive food writing as well. Lots of party and feast scenes. Um, I can't help but feel, since this was in the, 20, the uh, 1920s, it seemed like there was some analog to prohibition um, because we do actually get like hidden underground um, type scenes where um, there are people kind of whining and dining. Um, I'm trying to think what else. The, so it seemed like it had very comparable elements to what you would think of when you think of speakeasies, for instance. So um, that as well as the fairy fruit being smuggled in, um, I just drew a lot of connections there, so it seemed like a nod. Uh, and then, as well as that, I learned that Hope Mirlees also, on top of writing this, was a poet, 
and she as well had done translations of works from Russian. Um, so really interesting facts about her. Um, and I think, I think that's it for that one. Really liked it. It was a five star read for me. I loved it. Uh, so that was my adjustment in my prompt. I switched out uh, for that particular book in order to change my prompt to uh, sequential decades. So then I went ahead and read a book from the prior decade. This is from the 19-teens, Her Land uh, by Charlotte Perkins Gilman, who you may know from The Yellow Wallpaper, was writing in the 19-teens. And uh, this one was post uh, published originally as a serial, I believe in a magazine that Gil Gilman herself was publishing or editing. Um, this work is another really hilarious uh, satire work almost about a feminist utopia. Uh, so we have three explorers, Van, Jeff, and Terry, who are thinking that there are no new frontiers to explore in the world. They're off um, with a, a native um, indigenous, indigenous man who kind of nods to the fact that there is a country nearby that's all only women. And the men just can't believe that. So they go to, uh, or they go home and they start preparing to potentially look into this more. And uh, they do, they travel to the country of women and as soon as they get there, they're imprisoned. So they are set their um, expectations completely wrong. And uh, there are some just really hilarious passages. So their expectations being incorrect. Um, let me just read you this section. <clears throat> they would fight among themselves, Terry insisted. Women always do. We mustn't look to find any sort of order and organization. You're dead wrong, Jeff told him. It would be like a nunnery under an ab abbess, a peaceful, harmonious sisterhood. I snorted derision at this idea. Nuns indeed. Your peaceful sisterhoods were all celibate, Jeff, and under vows of obedience. These are just women and mothers, and where there's motherhood, you don't find sisterhood. Not much. No, sir, they'll scrap, agreed Terry. Also, we mustn't look for inventions and progress. They'll be awfully primitive. How about that cloth mill, Jeff suggested. Oh, cloth, women have always been spinsters, but there they stop, you'll see. We joked Terry about his modest impression that he would be warmly received, but he held his ground. You'll see, I'll get solid with them all and play one bunch against another. I'll get myself elected king in no time. Whew, Solomon will have to take a back seat. So particularly Terry has this very frat boy air about him. He's quite convinced that once he gets there, he'll be able to flirt them and woo them and convince them to get married. And then as soon as someone marries him, they will be feminine and pliable to kind of subservient to whatever he wants. So they find that is very much not the case. Um, Terry is quite put off when they arrive and the women are not feminine. Um, they're, they're not particularly interested in him wooing them or flirting with them. Uh, and they, in fact, do not have any interest in uh, being subservient to any of the guys. So, so they, they don't put up with any of their nonsense. Um, they do keep them captured until they learn the language. And then the book kind of breaks into these philosophical discussions about um, how the outside world is compared to this world of women and the problems of the outside world. And in particular, I love that the women always call out the men's way of speaking about things. So like there's a moment when one of the guys says, oh, a boy loves his dog, when they're just talking about animals and pets because the women have uh, kind of cultivated breeding. And the woman speaks up and says, oh, what about the girls? <laughs> so, and he says, oh yeah, you know, the girls love the dogs too. And so um, it just has this wit to it. It's, it's hilarious. Um, and then I think that um, just in general, for this being a serial, it really was cohesive. Um, it seemed like that shift toward the more philosophical discussions lost plot focus a little bit for me, 
Um, but this was a great read. I, again, was really surprised by how modern it felt. Um, and then one element to point out here actually is that um, I was not aware the, the women in this, uh, in this country reproduce asexually. So it's not quite the modern sense of asexual, but um, we have a type of asexual representation here, which was very interesting to me for it being, you know, the 19 teens. It, it was a very early representation of that, even if it was taking uh, inspiration from the more biological terminology uh, use of that. So then, number three, I went with a short work um, because uh, things kind of came up in my real life that were diverting me from my bigger plans. And so I actually picked up uh, the short story Shamblo by C.L. Moore. And that, I believe, was Moore's uh, first published work in 1933. Um, so I read works from the 19-teens, the 1920s, and the 1930s. Um, Moore was a contemporary and uh, someone who corresponded with H.P. Lovecraft. So that was a particular interest to me um, because I, I'm kind of fascinated by Lovecraft's work. Um, while I don't at all support his politics, um, I, so I wanted to check out Moore, who was one of the few women he interacted with um, in correspondence. And he held her in quite high regard. He retained a lot of her letters. Um, so we do have a lot of published letters between the two of them. So Chamblot is uh, an early work from the Weird Tales magazine, and it is a sci-fi following kind of a, uh, a rootin' tootin', uh, almost space cowboy guy named Northwest Smith. And he comes upon a crowd who is about to uh, kill a woman, basically. And they are all shouting about to the Shamblo, but he has no idea what that is. So um, he he saves her and takes her back to his room, and stashes her away there to keep her away from the angry crowd. And so, at one point, he you know he's feeling drawn to her, and but he notices something coming out from under her turban. And it seems like it's moving, but he's just not sure. And so he keeps leaving it coming back and he feels more and more drawn to her. But then he starts having strange dreams where he's almost paralyzed, like he can't move and is, he's in stone. Come to find out, um, we slowly uncover that, in fact, she does have tentacles up under her turban. And uh, this Shamblo is some sort of ancient alien race that uh, traces back to what we would consider uh, like Medusa or the Gorgons. And so she she very much attacks him and, um, and his friend ends up showing up to save him. So it's a really action-packed story. I think this is true, uh, true traditional pulp where it just is action beat, action beat, action beat all the way through. So it was a really fun read. Um, I was surprised by how taken by it I was, and I really enjoyed that tie-in to, uh, to the Medusa story. It was very interesting. So I actually do want to really check out some more of Moore's work, um, because she is yet another really foundational classic uh, woman author, and she has quite a lot in the um, SF pulp and sword and sorcery genres. So I want to pick up some more of her work. So I think that's it. It's getting quite dark for me here. So um, I apologize about the lighting. Um, I had a great time reading all these works for the Women Write Classic SFF Readathon. And I'm very thankful to Maya for hosting and for setting up the challenges. This was a lot of fun. Thank you all for watching, like and subscribe, and I hope you have a great week.